How do video games communicate meaning? There tends to be three avenues of meaning that form the basis of discussion about video games. Story, gameplay, and environment. Let's focus on that last one for a bit. Environmental storytelling is an interesting term, because it's somehow very plain and exact, but also very vague and nondescript. The idea is that the environment itself is telling a story. This should be fairly satisfactory for understanding the meaning of an environment, but I think we can expand on the concepts in a way few often think about. There are two games that I think serve as the best examples of how games can tell stories using their environment, Half-Life 1 and Shadow of the Colossus. Despite both using environmental storytelling, these games could not be more different in terms of how players experience said environments. Half-Life is tight, fast-paced, driven by constant encounters with enemies and NPCs, and ties its levels together to form a cohesive environmental experience that gives off the impression of being in one continuous space. Shadow of the Colossus is vast and expansive, yet slow and meditative. There are no common enemy types and no NPCs which the player interacts with. While the actual progression is linear, the way the player will experience the world isn't going to be strictly linear, and in contrast to Half-Life, will never barrel the player into tight corridors or intense scripted sequences. Both tell very interesting stories in their environment. Half-Life tells a story of a world that is currently falling apart, while Shadow of the Colossus tells a story of a world that fell long ago. You can see moments where these games actually do resemble each other and that they use subtle environmental cues to give an indication of some story that happened before they arrived that the player is meant to make sense of, mostly subconsciously. But there's a deeper layer that helps explain why these two linear stories have environments that feel so opposite one another. We need to talk about game space. Half-Life takes place in the Black Mesa Research Facility. Black Mesa is one of the most inventive and immersive settings I've seen in a game because it feels like a character unto itself. Tonally, it's this interesting mix of 90s disaster film, 50s sci-fi b-movie, and 80s action horror film. It combines the faux utopia of films like Total Recall with the monsters run amok stylings of films like Aliens. Black Mesa was clearly meant to be an all-purpose facility, somewhere that people live, sleep, work, eat, and die. It houses so many different divisions, with high-tech gadgetry and infrastructure for science, maintenance, food storage, chemical processing, and waste disposal, to name just a few. It is effectively its own super city, and yet something feels just so subtly off about it. The world of Black Mesa is vast, feeling as though it might stretch for miles, and yet so little of the experience of the game shows the player actual sunlight, to the point where it feels like a world away from the world, a well-kept secret that's likely also best-kept secret. These subtly off feelings conjured by Black Mesa are examples of potent environmental storytelling having an effect on the player. But how does that environmental story get told? It's told through a series of linear sequences through often fairly tight spaces that force the player to see only limited amounts of the facility at a time. The player is expected to piece together what Black Mesa was through what it's become. This isn't all done at once, but instead experienced bit by bit over the course of the entire game. That said, a lot of the heavy lifting is done in the first tram sequence of the game. The tram sequence is one of the most iconic gaming moments in part because of how much significance it has as an effective tool of storytelling and world building. The tram ride was an interactive credit sequence, allowing us to be immediately ported into the world of Half-Life upon pressing play. This intro sequence also serves additional functions, all of them necessary. It functions as a tutorial, giving the player a free space to figure out movement in a 3D, first-person environment, which at the time was still relatively new. It set the stage for the facility of Black Mesa, and introduced some key players in the story. The G-Man, the scientists, and the security guards. Most importantly for this video, the tram sequence serves as conditioning. By forcing the player to observe the environment without being able to really interact with it, the player is being conditioned to think critically about their surroundings for both narrative and gameplay purposes. This promotes a slight feeling of skepticism that will only grow and grow throughout the game. The game relies on elements of environmental storytelling to communicate a lot of its themes. 
and by conditioning the player to notice the environment before being able to interact with it, the player is being conditioned also to accept the environment as relevant information for the rest of the experience. There is a reason this form of storytelling was so effective and held up so well. The actual technical capabilities of the Gold Source engine and of most games at the time meant that vast open worlds were still years away from being a mainstream design philosophy. Instead, most games were stuck with tight corridors and heavily scripted sequences if they wanted to have full 3D rendering. Half-Life is the gold standard of making great art with the tools you've got. For a game from 1998, it holds up because it didn't try to extend past the technical limitations, but developed a story and world that was highly compatible with said limitations. Half-Life is, ultimately, a series of heavily linear, scripted sequences and predetermined encounters that will place the player in tight corridors, small vents, and the occasional open area. The engine didn't have a lot of options for space, so they made up for space by implying a bigger world than they could render. This is where the phrase game space comes in handy. There's a difference between the diegetic world of a game, which I like to call the game world, and the actual physical space that a player is expected to occupy throughout the course of a game, which I like to call the game space. Game spaces are important because they're part of the game world that players will be interacting with. So to create a meaningful relationship between the player and the world, they have to design the game space to make sense to the player and mask any limitations that the devs might have in rendering a fully realized world. Game space is a vital part of environmental storytelling because it's the part that players will be physically interacting with. Even though the world of Black Mesa is massive, the game space of Black Mesa is fairly cramped, narrow, and linear. The game does a good job explaining this by showing Black Mesa in a state of ongoing destruction and disarray. By having Gordon get into the guts of the facility through elevator shafts, vents, and the like, there's this feeling that Gordon is just barely making it through a massive research facility that is on the verge of total collapse. But all of this prompts an important question. Do game spaces tell their own story uniquely from the game world? After all, environmental storytelling is not unique to games. Any environment can tell a story. But gameplay can exist in a vacuum separate from environment. And so we have to ponder not just how the two work separate from one another, but how gameplay and environment tell a story together. And game spaces become important for understanding the story told through gameplay. The phrase I like to use for this concept is a ludic arc. Ludic, in this case, is derived from ludology, which is the study of games. A ludic arc is like a story arc, but for gameplay. Games can have an overall ludic arc for the entire duration of play, but most games don't have one singular arc, and instead have several arcs that form around a core gameplay loop. So let's look at Shadow of the Colossus. Shadow of the Colossus has a core gameplay loop that is very specific. Awaken in the Shrine of Worship, search for and travel to the arena of the next Colossus, attempt to figure out the puzzle of how to board and attack the Colossus, and then attack the Colossus until it dies. Now, the core gameplay loop has one crucial piece of information afterwards, which is that after killing the Colossus, there is first a cutscene showing its death, then players briefly regain control of Wander until the Colossus's spirit enters Wander's body, knocking him unconscious. Most players will likely try to run somewhere, oftentimes attempting to avoid getting knocked unconscious, but it never works. There's a ludic arc, a story being formed by the gameplay itself within Shadow of the Colossus's core gameplay loop. It starts in the Shrine of Worship and ends when Wander is knocked unconscious, and it's very consistent in having this arc occur again and again, largely unchanged, for each of the 16 Colossi. This means that, despite being a very vast world, Shadow of the Colossus doesn't quite count as an open world game. It also means that, despite there being a massive game space, the actual usage of the space is very linear and narrow. You eventually explore most of the area by virtue of the placement of the 16 Colossi, but the ludic arc of the game funnels people in a manner actually fairly similar to Half-Life. It's apparent that there is a relationship between game space and game play in telling a story. The environment of Shadow of the Colossus is vast, but the game doesn't place an expectation onto the player to actually explore it freely. This doesn't mean that the environment fails to tell an engaging story. 
It's just that the story is told by actually betraying the expectations placed onto the player and deciding to explore the space anyway. If you do decide to just explore the open environment rather than seeking out each colossus on a linear path, you might find details of note. Most notable is the easter egg of the secret garden, a location that's very difficult to get to and which gives you no reward, but which conveys a lot of meaning in terms of what this now abandoned world has left behind. The secret garden is a microcosm for the themes of the game that are subtly told through environment and gameplay, and it uses the vast open-ended game space not to communicate this theme to players, but to situate the theme within the game's world such that players might discover it for themselves without it ever being explicitly communicated. Shadow of the Colossus and Half-Life tell inverted stories from one another. Both promote skepticism of their environment. Half-Life does so by conditioning players to question what they see, while Shadow of the Colossus does so by pushing players to question what they do. Half-Life has no alternate path, but Shadow of the Colossus has many that the player can take at any time if they only think to do so. Over the past few years, I've become obsessed with the concept of game space and how game spaces communicate meaning in a way distinct from the diegetic reality that the game world is meant to create. As in, what does it mean that Black Mesa looks big, but feels small? What does it mean that Shadow of the Colossus is so vast, but we're never encouraged to explore it openly? Why design games this way? Why tell stories in this manner? Another great example of how a ludic arc is formed via the design and usage of a game space is the original Dark Souls. In Dark Souls, you start the main section of the game at its hub, Firelink Shrine. All directions away from Firelink Shrine will eventually be explored, but the player isn't informed which direction is best. Dark Souls gives players freedom to explore, but gradually funnels new players towards the path most suited to them. In this case, that will be the Undead Bird. It's important to note that the way progress works in Dark Souls is via the bonfire system. Resting at bonfires serves as checkpoints that players will return to when they die. If the player makes it to the first bonfire in the Undead Burg, this will be the first time they won't be able to return to Firelink Shrine after dying. Dark Souls can be pretty difficult for new players, but the Undead Burg is an area that helps players develop the skills necessary to play through the rest of the game. With enough time, new players will kill the Taurus Demon, make it past the Hellkite Dragon on the bridge, rest at the bonfire at the entrance to the Undead Parish, kill or pass the boar, make it inside of the parish's chapel, and, just when they think they could not be further away from where they started, they find an elevator which leads them down, down, down. And then the title appears, Firelink Shrine. It turns out they went in a circle. Dark Souls is often praised for its interconnected world where areas will wrap back around on themselves and players can return to previous areas, creating faster paths between different areas via shortcuts. Importantly, the first experience of a shortcut back to Firelink Shrine forms a ludic arc, the journey away from a safe place that eventually returns unexpectedly back to the safe place. Firelink Shrine is one of the most interesting areas in any game because of how its appearance at various times will change meaning depending on context, with most of the context being supplied by the gameplay itself. Firelink Shrine should, for first-time players, initially evoke a sense of adventure and mystery. They've arrived in a new land, and they were dropped into the one safe place in it. We don't know what this place is yet, so we don't know if we should be afraid or excited. Coming back to Firelink through a shortcut for the first time creates this feeling almost like you've solved a small puzzle, and with it, that feeling of mystery will change to a feeling of comfort, the sense that you've made it safely back to what will start to feel like a home for the player. It's because of how the game space took the player seemingly far away from Firelink and then surprised the player by returning them to it that an arc forms that conveys meaning to the player. It's not done through lore or through details in the environment, it's done through the actual physical space of the game and how the player experiences traversing it. 
The physicality of a game will greatly impact its meaning in so many ways, but it's something that is often left unexplored in discussions of games because people tend to think of gameplay as what the player does and environment as what the game does, without ever viewing the two in connection to one another. There's no best way to tell a story in games, but generally, players want to feel like their actions have some sort of meaning. Meaning in this case can be evoked in a number of ways. A high score to suggest that better performance leads to a better reward, consequences for actions players took or failed to take, story beats or scripted sequences that make the player feel like they're part of some broader unfolding narrative. As someone who loves the quote-unquote walking simulators even though they often give players very little in the way of input to alter the outcome of the story, it's apparent that there's more to storytelling than just the biggest decisions that players make. If the point of Shadow of the Colossus was simply to slay the Colossi, then there would be no reason why most of the actual gameplay is just riding a horse through a vast, empty land. Minutia is a part of game experiences and part of the meaning we take away from the experience. Game spaces become important because they become a huge part of what we do most during playtime. I'd argue games benefit from a game space that is both cohesive and generally available to the player. A cliff will always be better than an invisible wall. Even though they both serve the same function spatially, the former does a better job of making the player feel like their role in the game space is meaningful. Nobody wants to fall off a cliff, but nobody expects to walk into an invisible wall. Basically, you want players to feel like what they do has meaning inside of the world and space of the game. You don't want to sacrifice that feeling of being part of the world to force them to be part of the experience. So if the game space isn't going to represent the world in full, it should represent enough of the world that players don't feel like they're missing part of the action by being confined to the space they're in. It's also important to create a game space that communicates meaning differently from player desires. What players want isn't always what they need for the experience to be good. A good design for a level or world will not be fully molded to player wants because no actual world is like that. I've mentioned this in my video, A Brief Moment of Meaning in Mario Sunshine. Sunshine is one of my favorite games because it exemplifies how environments can be used creatively. In that video, I mentioned how one specific wall in Rico Harbor was designed to be difficult for players to scale. This connected the gameplay of Sunshine to its core theme, the game being largely about how Mario acclimates to a new culture and becomes accepted as one of them through acts of perseverance and good Samaritanism. The game needed to feel like a place that Mario doesn't initially belong to, but over time starts to belong same as anyone else. And they pull this off by having the level design be very naturalistic and make sense as villages, harbors, hotels, etc. These non-abstract designs mean that the game sacrifices pure platforming for a more immersive experience, feeling like you really are jumping around in a village, a harbor, an amusement park, etc. This makes the process of mastering the levels feel more meaningful than if they were just abstract platformers like in early 2D Mario games, because the game space is representative of something tangible that we can comprehend and relate to. This is great design, but it requires resisting the player's wants a little. So coming back to that initial wall, the wall can be overcome through skilled platforming. But by resisting the player and making it a little more difficult to overcome, providing several potential solutions of varying difficulty, players make the wall theirs, feeling more connected to the game space and thus more connected to the culture of Isle Delfino. Game spaces can often have an unstated conflict that players resolve through their actions. This generates ideal actions that players discover themselves that help them feel like they're part of the world, and thus make the space feel like a meaningful part of the bigger picture of the game. And the result is that it creates a narrative through play. Another great example of a narrative being created through play is Katamari Damacy. Katamari Damacy presents itself as an absurdist comedy, and this manifests equally in the gameplay as it does in the story. But the world itself in Katamari Damacy is strange. Not only is it cluttered to an absurd degree, but it's also populated with endless amounts of strange creatures and items that would not make sense in the locations they're found in. Katamari Damacy attempts to approximate a real world, but through an absurdist lens. It's a world of chaos, but not chaos in the socio-political sense. 
It's chaos in a more innocent sense, like the chaos of a child's messy bedroom. And it feels like this might be an intentional parallel, as Katamari Damacy is effectively a cleaning game where the player is a child tasked with actually cleaning up this massive, ongoing mess because he was told to by his father. The core gameplay loop of Katamari Damacy is as follows. The prince, our protagonist, is given a Katamari ball, a sticky ball that can roll up objects and increase in size as more objects stick to it. You're given a time limit and a target size for the Katamari. You roll around, picking up various objects that become part of the Katamari ball until you eventually grow the ball big enough to reach the target size. At that point, you can continue to pick up objects as much as you want until the timer runs out. At first, this is mostly a cute refrain, because the player begins at a very small size, picking up very small objects. But there's an overall ludic arc at play. The bigger the Katamaris get, the more the nature of the task starts to shift tone. First, the player is picking up cockroaches, batteries, and buttons. But with each new level, the target size will get bigger, and soon you'll find yourself picking up frogs, rats, golf balls, buckets, toy trucks, etc. Early on, we see objects that are far too big to pick up even from the very first level. Chairs, tables, cats, dogs, children, adults. As far as the early levels are concerned, these are non-interactables in the game space. In other words, they effectively serve as a wall, an obstacle to avoid on your path to finding objects to pick up. Eventually, you get big enough that the cat that earlier might have terrorized your Katamari ball is now looking pretty small, and a thought occurs. Can you pick up the cat? And eventually, it happens. You pick up the cat. This previously non-interactable object becomes interactable, and it sets a precedent that takes on a darkly comedic undertone. If the cat was just a matter of time, then what does that say about the other obstacles we've been introduced to? The placement of humans in the early levels I think is very deliberate in foreshadowing the big comedic moment of the game. Said big comedic moment comes when you get big enough that you first run into a small child and realize that, yes, you can roll up the humans. Suddenly, the tone goes from charming to ambiguously murderous, and the Katamari cleanup task becomes evident as a rampage. The moment isn't done through cutscene or through story beats, but instead through the usage of the game space, populating the levels with both interactable and non-interactable objects, and then setting the precedent that the bigger you get, the more objects will become interactable, such that you gradually realize that, yes, you are supposed to actually grab large groups of humans and launch them into space on the project of fixing the cosmos. What makes this so darkly comedic is the realization that humanity is not just causing the mess that the prince is tasked with cleaning up, they're part of the mess. That humans are clutter, just like all of the things we produce. The game progresses much further from there, as the comedy becomes fixed on one general question. How big is the limit? And the absurdity of Katamari Damacy is in gradually realizing that there might not actually be a limit. And just when you think the limit has been reached, you find yourself instead picking up full cars, then buildings, then chunks of the earth, and then eventually, all of the countries on the planet. What makes Katamari Damacy so special is that just about everything you see, eventually, you can interact with. Everything you thought would be a non-starter for rolling up with your Katamari can, actually, be rolled up. The game uses the game space to great effect because it plays with our preconceived notion of how a game space works. 3D games generally have interactable in-game objects and non-interactable pieces of level geometry. Sometimes the level geometry in question can appear on the surface to be something the player might want to interact with, like a locked door that never actually opens. These non-interactable objects help make the world feel more fully realized, but don't actually impact gameplay in any meaningful way. Katamari Damacy plays on this tradition by shocking players with how much of the game is actually interactable. When the player is picking up buildings and chunks of earth, that's the moment when it becomes apparent that our concept of something being strictly non-interactable isn't a hard rule of level design. The humor of Katamari Damacy's gameplay is as absurd as its world and its characters, but this absurdity packs the punch that it does because of the ludic arc that is expressed through the extended time in the game space. 
You spend several levels as a small Katamari ball, picking up small objects while only seeing the implication of a world around you in living rooms and backyards. The scale is small, and the scope is small. But as the scale and scope get bigger, we eventually wrap back around to the original home we started in and absolutely demolish it. This comedic return to a point of origin hammers home the point that our destruction and chaos knows no bounds. It's like a reverse scenario from the Firelink Shrine return in Dark Souls. The brilliance of the game is how everything you see, eventually, you can roll up. The game space does a lot of setting up so that the payoff will come, not through a cutscene or a scripted sequence, but through an action the player will themselves choose to take.